Well, as, as uh, many of you know, we've been uh, through the Christmas season this year. We have been looking at the message and the meaning of Christmas through the idea of giving gifts. And uh, this morning, our mess, my message is t- uh, titled, uh, Some Assembly Required. And uh, I'm going to ask you, if you will, join me in reading uh, John 3.16. And it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm sorry, eternal life. The greatest gift we have is the gift of Jesus Christ. And uh, this Christmas, as with every Christmas, with many gifts we get, we always want to remember the most important gift, the gift of Jesus. Now, we've all had to deal with different gifts at Christmas, have we not? And uh, for those of you who are dads, you've had to deal with gifts that have this wonderful little tag on it that says, Some Assembly Required. And this becomes your job. You may open it up, and there'll be a very simple diagram to look at, which tells you how to assemble. It'll have recommended tools. You'll need a screwdriver. You may need a crescent wrench or a pair of pliers. I found it doesn't say hammer very often. Even more rarely does it say duct tape, but so often we wind up using those. Now, the child will wait impatiently for you as you try to assemble the toy. Well, in this whole idea of some assembly required, I think it relates to us as Christians. So I have some thoughts for you this morning as we look at this concept and how it relates to us and who we are in Jesus Christ. There's an outline to follow along in the bulletin. Um, And the first idea this morning that I want you to remember is this. Be patient. Just as a child can be very impatient waiting for a toy or something to be assembled, we need to be patient as well. I came across this cartoon where this, per- this character says, God, grant me patience. And then says, hurry up, right? I want patience and I want it now. So what do we need to be patient about? Well, let's look at what Paul said in the book of uh, Philippians. He said this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This passage is sometimes misunderstood, um, and I want to clear this up first. We do not work for our salvation. We work at our salvation. Remember what Paul said in the book of Ephesians. He said, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. So we don't work for our salvation. We work out our salvation. Well, what does that mean? The the term that uh, Paul uses here, to work out, it means to bring something to fulfillment. It means to bring something to completion. It's kind of the same word you would use when you talk about working out a math problem. Or uh, in, in Paul's day, it was the same phrase they would use, a farmer would use, when he would talk about working out a field. You start by planting, and then you water, and all these things that you do with a farm field. You work out that field to bring it to harvest, to get all you need to get from it and bring it to completion. So when Paul says we need to work out our salvation, he's saying that we need to do just that. You see, that moment of salvation, that moment where you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, is just the beginning, friends. Now that you receive the gift of salvation, you need to explore all the riches that you have in Jesus Christ. You can't just be satisfied with knowing that you're going to heaven, because that's just the beginning. We need to continue to unwrap this gift, this gift of salvation. And as we will see, and as we probably already know, that with this gift, there is some assembly required. But we also need to know that with all of this, it's not a short-term project. This gift of salvation is a lifelong project. Look what Paul says in Philippians. He said, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This is neat. 
a good work. That good work is salvation. That is the good work that Christ has begun in each of us. You see, unlike a toy or a tool which requires some assembly, this gift comes with a service contract because he will carry it out to completion. God will continue to work on us and work in us and work through us as we explore all that we have in him as we apply Christ to our lives. And then he says this at the end of this passage. He says, until the day... Of Christ Jesus until the day when Christ returns God will continue to work on each of us you see there's never a moment while you're on this earth and while you're living that God will stop working on you he's never done with you he will always be working on you therefore we can never say well it looks like I've arrived now no you haven't because God is continuing to work on you You see, friends, the gift of salvation is a gift we spend a lifetime unwrapping and discovering. It is truly the gift that keeps on giving. We have a lifelong service contract. We have a lifetime warranty. Is there anything else that we can say that about? I'm not sure there is. Because everything else wears out, doesn't it? But the gift of salvation is a gift that never, ever wears out. But here's the really, really cool part. Now call this part no missing parts. Friends, there's never any missing parts. It's happened to you before, hasn't it? You're you're assembling something and you're looking and you're looking through the box and you're looking through the bag of of parts and you're going, well wait a minute, where's part number A stroke 27 dash five? It's not in here, and you're tearing through everything, and it's just not there. But we find a way to make it work usually, don't we? In my garage, I usually have boxes of, or containers of little screws and bolts and nuts and all kinds of things that I can usually make work. But the most frustrating thing is when you're looking through all this stuff, and you can't find that part that's supposed to be in there, you see this little tag that says, uh, it says something really, really important. It says this, inspected by 204. At that point, you want to know who is 204, right? Who is 204? Who is 204? Because you want to call the company up and say, I'd like to speak to 204, please. Because on the day that they were assembling this package that came to my house, 204 was not doing their job. Because piece number A-7, stroke J, whatever, isn't there. Is there really a 204? We may never know. Always seems to be the last piece of the project, doesn't it, too? And sometimes when we're putting something together, we wonder, why did they do it that way? Wouldn't it have been easier if they would have done it this way? This would have been simpler. You know, it's like when you're working on cars or you take a little motor apart or something you're working on and you find out that they've put a plastic gear up against a metal gear. Guys, can I get a witness? Who in their right mind puts a plastic gear up against a metal gear? Because what happens? The plastic gear breaks, it wears out, or whatever. Why did they design it that way? Well, they designed it that way so that you'd buy a new plastic gear and you'd have to pay maintenance, right? I remember our first minivan we ever owned. And I remember the first time I went to change the spark plugs on it. The engineers, maybe they were hanging out with Inspector 204 that day, but there were six plugs, three on each side. The first two plugs in the front were easy. You open up the hood and you get to them. The next two plugs, you had to jack up the car take the front wheel off, and there was a hole in the wheel well where you had to take an extra long socket to pull the second plug out. The third set of plugs was in the car where it had a little doghouse that you lifted and removed the third plugs. What is the matter with people, right? Why would they do something like that? And it leaves you shaking your head. Why did they do it that way? You you, you think they built the car and then they decided... Oh, yeah, someday they're going to have to change the spark plugs. But you know what the cool thing is, friends? Not that I want to go on a long rant about my old minivan. When we look at what God has done, we can never say that. You see, because God had everything planned out from the very beginning. We can't say, God, why'd you do it that way? We could, but the truth is we know one very important thing. 
God's a lot smarter than we are, isn't he? Look what David said in Psalm 139. This is really cool. He says this. You formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Wow. You see, David understood this, and what we need to remember is this, too, that God was working on us before we were even born. I don't know about you, but for me, that's very comforting to think about that. Now, some of you may start looking at your flaws and say, oh, okay, but what about this about me? What about that about me? And that's, it's human nature. And we may even ask the question, what was he up to? What was he up to? Because when God was putting you together, and God was putting each of us together, he had, he had our flaws in mind. Really? Yeah, really. What about my flaws? You may be thinking, what about my illness? What about this problem? What about that problem? God, was that part of your plan? God, what are you up to, you may ask. But David understood clearly that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So how does that all work? If God knew us from the beginning, if God knit us in our mother's wombs, and he created us with all these flaws, how does that work? Why does God create us the way he creates each of us? Why does he create some of us with different disabilities or challenges? Why does he create us with certain abilities or certain talents or certain gifts? But remember this. God created each of us with every part of who we are. We could each look at God and say, God, you made all that I am specifically the way that I am. Why? Well, let's look at what God told Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Wow. So God is telling Jeremiah that as he put him together in his mother's womb and he put all the little parts that make, that make a perfect Jeremiah, he said, you know, as I was putting you together and giving you all the parts that I knew that you would need, I had plans for you. I had plans for you. And this is true for all of us, friends. He made us the way we are for a specific purpose and calling, each of us. Friends, he saved you for a reason. He created you for a purpose. And God has appointed each of us to a specific calling. I've kind of reworded Jeremiah's, uh, this verse in Jeremiah, and I kind of put it in my own words. And this is what I came up with. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you for a specific purpose. Friends, that's true of all of us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God formed you and appointed you for a specific purpose? He created you for more than just knowing him as Savior and being able to go to heaven. God gave you specific attributes, specific talents, specific skills, and specific challenges. And he gave you those things so that he can use you in a way that he can't use anyone else. Now, right now, you may not know what that purpose is, and that's okay. I believe that's one of the reasons where Paul says we have to continue to work out our salvation. We need to continue to seek God and discover what he created us for. He has created each of us uniquely so that he can use each of us in a distinctive way. You see, friends, as Christmas approaches, let's celebrate our gift of salvation. And let's continue to discover all that God has given us through that special gift of Jesus Christ. As I said before, why would he give you the gift of salvation? He saved you for a reason. He saved you for a purpose. And from day one, 
for me, from that moment when I was saved, God put a question in my heart. What do you want me to do with this? And I remember that right away. I was like, gosh, this is incredible news. And I kept asking, God, what do you want me to do with this? And I remember talking to uh, some guys who I knew who were further along in their faith. And I said, what do I do now? What do I do next? God, what do you want me to do with this? It's a question that we should continue to ask. God, you saved me. What do you want me to do with this? You see, we need to continue to unwrap the gift of salvation. We were all designed with the purpose to bring God glory. And we know that in every part of our lives. But we need to continue to discover all the ways that God intends to use each of us and how he intends each of us to use the gift he has given. And we need to be patient. Friends, you have all the parts you need. There are no missing parts, but there may be some assembly required as we continue to work out our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we need to be patient as God reveals his plan for us. Sometimes it's hard to be patient, isn't it? Are you, are you still here? Yeah? Is it hard to be patient? I remember conf being confused when God called me to ministry. And I said, God, what are you doing? Why would you call me to ministry now? It would have been a heck of a lot easier if you called me four years ago. To which I eventually learned that, yeah, it would have been easier, wouldn't it? But I also learned that God kind of showed me that if I'd have called you then, you wouldn't have even heard me. I had to wait till you were listening before I could call you. So we have to be patient because God's working on us and God is assembling us and God is molding us and shaping us. And when he, it comes to that moment where he reveals to you those things that he has designed you specifically for, when he reveals it to you, you'll be ready to hear it. You'll be ready to follow. You'll be ready to respond. How do I know that? Because God's a lot, more, lot smarter than we are. And he knows what he's doing. So as Christmas approaches and as we celebrate the gift of salvation, let's continue to unwrap that gift. Let's continue to discover and experience all that we have through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come as we finish our service this morning. I have another song that I want us to sing. and uh, You know, when I look at that that passage, and we looked at two passages this morning where God, God tells Jeremiah that he knew him in his mother's womb, and David says to God that I know that you knew me in my mother's womb. When we look at those things, we say, wow. Father, as we continue to uh, prepare for the celebration of Christmas, Lord, may we continue to unwrap the amazing gift of salvation through our Savior. Teach us what it means to understand all that we are and all that we have in you and help us to discover all that you have planned for us, Lord, because we want to glorify you and we want to be used by you. So as we leave this place today, Lord, teach us, reveal yourself to us, reveal your plan to us so that those we meet know we serve a risen Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day.